All right, so we're going to finish up chapter 20 with the blood vessels by looking at the circulatory routes. Now, we've already talked a little bit about this, but blood vessels are organized into parallel routes, and they deliver blood throughout the entire body. And you can actually see that here in this picture. If you'll notice, as those capillary beds are forming, they're actually forming the shape of a lot of these organs, like the liver, the stomach, the intestines, the brain, and even the lungs. Now, systemic circulation is the largest circulation route that we're going to talk about, and there are going to be three kind of subdivisions with it. Coronary circulation or cardiac circulation, which is to the heart itself, the myocardium muscle. Cerebral circulation, which is to the brain. And then hepatic portal circulation, which is the circulation between the GI tract and the liver. We're also going to take a look at pulmonary circulation to the lungs and fetal circulation. So let's look at the pulmonary circulation actually first. Now pulmonary circulation, guys, is opposite of all the other blood vessels. Now remember, I've talked to you about how a lot of times we talk about arteries being red and veins being blue, but we can't really do that. Remember that arteries are any vessels leaving the heart, going away from the heart, and veins are going back towards the heart. This is where the opposite comes into play. Since these particular arteries are leaving the right side of the heart and going to the lungs, we see that they are blue, but they're still arteries because they're leaving the heart. They're gonna go to the lungs and then pick up the oxygen. They pick up the oxygen and then the veins bring the blood back to the left side of the heart. In this process, we see that those veins are going to be red because they are oxygenated. They've picked up the blood within the alveoli, those structures inside of the lungs. Now, all other arteries carry oxygenated blood and all other veins carry deoxygenated blood except for the pulmonary. The right and left pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle of the heart to the alveoli in the lungs. The pulmonary capillaries are where the exchange happens, so oxygen moves from the lungs to the blood, and carbon dioxide moves from the blood to the lungs. And then the right and left pulmonary veins are going to carry the oxygenated blood back to the left atria of the heart. All right, so this has a picture here for you as well as a description that can help with a chart to go over the pulmonary circulation. All right, so let's look at the systemic circulation. Now, systemic circulation is in some subdivisions, but the whole point of the systemic circulation is it's going to take that oxygenated blood from the left ventricle of the heart. It's going to push it into the aorta, and the aorta is going to help distribute that blood to the whole rest of the body. This returns the deoxygenated blood then back to the right side of the heart so that then it can go into the pulmonary circulation, which we just talked about. The aorta is divided into three regions. Each region has its branches and services a particular area of the body. So the ascending aorta, the part that goes up, because the aorta is going to branch, so the ascending going up is going to branch into your right and left coronary arteries. This is going to branch and go directly back to the heart itself, supplying the mitocardium, the heart muscle, with the oxygen and the nutrients it needs in order to have ATP and contract. The arc of the aorta, where it's curving, is going to then have some branches. It's going to have a right and left carotid artery, and the carotids go up in the neck. These are going to deliver blood to the head and the neck region, particularly the cerebral type of circulation for your brain. We also have a branch that's the right and left subclavian, because subclavian means below the clavicle. So they're going to go below the clavicle, and they're going to deliver oxygenated blood to your arms. Okay, so that's what we see on the arc of the aorta. The descending aorta, the part going down, is going to be situated ne near your vertebral body of T4, so thoracic vertebrae 4, behind the heart, and it's going to be kind of branched, okay, or it's not really branched, we're going to put it in sections. So the thoracic aorta is the top section of that descending aorta, and it contains several branches that supply the thoracic organs with oxygen. We then see the abdominal aorta is the lower section of this descending aorta, and it passes through the diaphragm. Remember the muscle, that dome muscle has a hole that this goes through, and it contains many branches that are going to supply your abdominal and pelvic tissues and organs, as well as supplying oxygen and nutrients to your legs. So if we take a look here, guys, these are the vessels we're kind of talking about. This is showing the systemic circulation. In the picture over here, we see the heart's been removed. So you can see how the aorta branches and then goes behind 
the heart. All right, but you can see the branches that are coming off, going directly to the heart, going up to the, the brain, going out to the arms and legs, down, sorry, out to the arms, and then down to the rest of the body and the legs. Now, what about getting the blood back to the heart? Well, we have deoxygenated blood, which is going to return to the heart through the systemic veins. These are going to drain into one of three vessels. We have first the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava is going to receive blood from above your diaphragm. So above into the chest, the arms, and the head, they're going to drain into the superior vena cava. They're going to drain from the right and left subclavian veins back into the superior vena cava and the right and left jugulars from your head coming back down in through the neck to that superior vena cava as well. The inferior vena cava known as the IVC receives blood from the veins below your diaphragm. Guys, the IVC is the largest vein or vessel you have in your body and it's about an inch and a half in diameter. It's very large. The right and left common iliac veins are going to bring the blood up from the legs and going to, to merge in there with that abdominal IVC. The IVC may get compressed during like preg pregnancy and this is what causes edema and swelling in the legs, the feet, and also sometimes temporary varicose veins. The last little bit of blood is going to drain back into the heart through the coronary sinus. This is on the back of the heart. This is where the blood servicing the heart itself is going to collect and it's kind of like one of those buckets at a splash pad. It fills and then it dumps. It fills and then it dumps and it's dumping this blood back into the right atria. Okay, so all of these are going to empty into the right atria and allow for then pulmonary circulation to take place. So guys, here's giving you an idea of what these veins look like. And again, just like we saw from the artery picture, I'm not going to have you learn every one of these, but you do need to take a look at these structures. Okay, so although I'm not going to hold you responsible for every blood vessel shown in chapter 20, because there's a lot, you do need to be able to ID certain ones, okay, based on the location. So iliac, femoral, peritoneal artery, anterior and posterior tibial, those are all going to be in the leg popliteal, that kind of thing, axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar, palmar, all those are in the arm, renal is kidney, gonadal are the gonads, so the testes or ovaries, the pharynx is going to be the diaphragm, cerebral is the brain, hepatic is the liver, so you need to review a lot of that terminology that we were supposed to learn back in anatomy one and see how it relates to these vessels. All right, so now let's talk about the hepatic portal circulation. Okay, this hepatic portal vein is going to carry blood from the veins of the GI tract, specifically the pancreas, spleen, stomach, intestines, and gallbladder, and it's going to send this blood to the liver. Now, this is a vein, so it's already deoxygenated blood, so this is not delivering oxygen to the liver. The liver is going to get its oxygen from the hepatic artery. But this is bringing all the nutrients and the stuff that's been absorbed from the digestive system. And it's going to take it to that liver first. So blood at the GI tract has just absorbed a ton of nutrients. But again, it's low in oxygen because it's given the oxygen to those tissues. The liver gets first choice of these nutrients. Now you're thinking, why the liver? Why not the brain? Well, the liver is going to help detoxify and also make sure that it stores things that are in abundance. It's going to allow us to be able to have a storage place and then also detoxify any substances before it gets to some of those vital organs like the brain. Many of these nutrients get stored away in that liver. Others get chemically modified before they go into the general circulation to the rest of the body. And the liver also detoxifies any harmful substances. Now, the hepatic artery is going to carry this oxygenated blood to the liver, delivering oxygen. The hepatic vein is going to carry all the blood, even the blood that came from the hepatic portal vein. It's going to take all the blood once it's filtered through the liver back to the IVC, the inferior vena cava. This is going to return it back to that circulation. Okay, so this is just a special kind of branch of circulation where the liver is going to help adjust and monitor what then nutrient-wise enters into the bloodstream. All right, then we want to talk about fetal circulation. Now, guys, fetal circulation involves the exchange of materials between the fetus and the mother. 
the mother's circulation must deliver that oxygen and those nutrients to the fetus because the fetus cannot breathe in any oxygen while it's in that fluid, the amniotic fluid. But also, the mother's body is going to help eliminate the waste from the fetus, okay? So the waste products due to the metabolism, the, the cellular respiration that this baby does, the mom's going to have to get rid of that as well. Now, how does it do this? Well, it's going to do it through a pl the placenta. The placenta is an organ or structure which allows this exchange to take place. So the placenta contains many fetal capillaries. These capillaries are attached to the umbilical cord. These capillaries are in close contact with the mother's uterine blood vessels. So they're not actually touching, but they're in very close contact. This is going to allow for diffusion to happen from mother to baby, from baby to mother. They're very close in contact. Nutrients diffuse from mom to baby, and waste is going to diffuse in the reverse because it's going to use the same rules of diffusion. When it's high, it's going to move from high to low. High oxygen to low oxygen from mom to baby. Carbon dioxide, high in baby, moving to low area with mom. So we see that there's going to be that movement of diffusion. And there's no actual mixing of blood at this point. The only time blood mixes is actually during the childbirthing process when the placenta pulls away. Those vessels then get damaged, and in that process, some blood can be exchanged. But in the normal process of the developing baby, there's no actual contact between mother's blood and baby's blood. Now, fetal circulation is similar to pulmonary circulation. The umbilical vein is going to carry oxygenated blood from the placenta to the liver, okay, to the liver of the baby. It's then going to go through this particular kind of connection called the ductus venosus. The ductus venosus carries oxygenated blood into the inferior vena cava. This is going to also pick up the deoxygenated blood from the lower part of the fetus's body. And so because of this, you're going to have oxygenated blood mixed with deoxygenated blood. Well, what happens when you mix red paint with blue paint? Well, you get purple. And so if you'll see in a picture, and you can see it here in this picture, there is a purple. There's a mixture that's happening here. All right. So you don't see like a really strong red and a really strong blue. A lot of times it's going to be more of this purplish color. So then the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava are going to drain into the right atria of the heart, just like it does in anybody else, like in adults. However, in the heart, there is a special hole. We know it's a hole because it's a foramen. Remember, foramen is the word we use for hole. This is the foramen ovule. It's an opening in the interatrial septum. So it's a hole in between the right atria and the left atria. So some of the blood will actually move from the right atria straight to the left atria. It does not go through the pulmonary circulation because it doesn't have to. It's not going to pick up any oxygen in those baby's lungs. Even though the baby is practicing breathing, it's not going to do that exchange. This then allows it to go from the left atria straight into the aorta. This goes into that systemic circulation. Now, some of the blood is going to go ahead and move through the normal sequence from the right atria to the right ventricle, then to the pulmonary trunk. But when it gets to the pulmonary trunk, instead of going to the lungs, we see there's another connection from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta, and it's called the ductus arteriosus. This is going to connect the aortic arch so that it can bypass the fetal lungs again because there's no point. There's no point in the blood traveling that distance into the lungs when no exchange is going to take place. But at birth, the baby has to transition super quickly into sending the blood actually to the lungs. So when the baby's lungs, liver, and digestive system begin to function at birth, these special structures are no longer needed. So they're going to start to vanish. The umbilical vein, umbilical artery are going to atrophy up and they're going to seal off and they're going to actually create a type of scar tissue we call your belly button. The ductus venosus and the uh, foramen ovule as well as the ductus arterosus are going to also just become more of like a tendon or closed off space. And so those areas are no longer going to be functional in the blood moving for the most part. Sometimes this does not occur and if it doesn't occur we might say that that child still has a hole in its heart. It may need to be corrected if it does not close up on its own. 
So if you take a look, this is showing you the fetal circulation. You have the placenta connected to the umbilical cord going to the baby. You can see the blood in the baby is mostly purple, especially in that heart region. And then we have a flow chart over here to help you see where the placenta is going to be, where the oxygenated blood gets picked up through the umbilical vein, goes through the ductus venosus at the liver into the inferior vena cava. Now this is all purple because we have a mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. You'll also notice that it bypasses the pulmonary, or uh, sorry, the lungs and the pulmonary veins when the baby is in utero. Okay, so this is just showing you kind of in a flow chart what's happening with the blood as well. All right, so guys, disorders of, these are things talked about in your textbook, and we talked about them as well within the chapter. Edema is swelling. A lot of times the swelling is due to that whole idea of the filtration rate and the reabsorption rate not being equal, so the lymphatic system is going to have to come in and help. Varicose veins and arterial sclerosis where we have a buildup of plaque that happens in those arteries, normally due to cholesterol issues. All right, but take a look at those little sections within your textbook, and then that's gonna finish up our notes for chapter 20, the blood vessels. If you have any questions, please let me know.